Bibles. We'll be in 1 Corinthians. That's where my text comes from. Just one verse here this morning. If you couldn't tell from the hymns already, this, we're going to be talking about the cross today. Taking a break from our look through Romans chapter 12 just to focus on the story of Christ on the cross and what it means for us today, still today. Before we go any further, let's just ask God's blessing on our time here this morning. Lord, we do give you thanks for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he was willing to come and to give himself as a sacrifice for us and for our sins. Lord, we thank you that through him today we can have hope, a sure and steadfast hope that nothing and no one can take from us because the hope rests in Jesus who died and who rose again victorious over the grave, over sin and death and hell. So we praise you, Lord, for it. We praise you for uh, the, the, the joy that we have from the gospel, through the gospel. Just pray your blessing upon your word. May we be listening for your still small voice as you speak to our hearts. May we be willing to respond as your Holy Spirit speaks to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Let me start this morning by saying this. Christianity is not about Christians. Christianity is about Christ. Let me say that again. Christianity is not about Christians. Christianity is about Christ. Now, why do I say such a thing? I'll tell you why. I grew up in a Christian home. My dad was a pastor. But that didn't make me a Christian. That was still a decision I needed to make for myself. No one else could make it for me. And even though I was only eight years old at the time, I understood enough to realize I was personally responsible to God. No one becomes a Christian automatically, by osmosis, by decree, or because your granny went to church and she read your Bible stories when you were little. Each individual is individually responsible to God for his or her actions, for what you choose to believe in, for what you do with the life that you're given. And as I said, at eight years of age, I understood enough to know I needed to trust in Jesus. Now, I may have grown up in a pastor's home, but I certainly haven't lived in a goldfish bowl. Over the years, my faith has been challenged many times. I've had as many opportunities to depart from the faith as the next one. But I'm still here. I'm still a Christian. And it's not because I'm such a great guy. <laughs> uh, the reason I'm still a Christian today is because Jesus is real. And I can experience His grace in my life every day. So back to my original statement. You see, Christianity is not about Christians. It's about Christ. Perhaps exactly because I grew up in a minister's home, I'm in a better position than most to know what Christians can be like. Some Christians I've met have been some of the nicest people you could ever want to know. Examples to me of what I want to be for Jesus. And then there are others. They profess to know Christ too. They also go to church, sometimes even regularly. But their lives, despite all their religiosity, leave a lot to be desired. Almost impossible to detect anything of the true spirit of Christ and His grace in them. They're the kind of so-called Christians that give Christianity a bad name. I've said this before, but I've spent more of my life than I should have had to apologizing for the behavior of people who call themselves Christians. I want to plead with people don't turn your back on Jesus and his gracious offer of salvation. Don't walk away from your only hope because of a hypocrite. When you do so, you're just handing the victory over to them. And you're worth so much more than that. By definition, a hypocrite is false. They're not what they claim to be. It's not God who's failed you, it was the hypocrite. It's not Jesus who let you down. It was the hypocrite. For many people, it seems to be the easiest thing just to walk away from Jesus 
But when you do, you're walking away from the only one who can bring true healing to your soul. Truth is, not one of us, not even the most dedicated and sincere Christian will ever live a perfect life. Only Jesus did that. The rest of us, well, we all make mistakes. We're all still far too prone to temptation and to sin. As Christians, we might have dedicated our lives to live for Jesus. We might have given, we might have been given the Holy Spirit to, to dwell within us, to guide us, to equip us to live for God and for His glory. But we still inhabit this old body of flesh and blood with all of its sinful desires and habits and habits and, and we can get it easily so wrong. Especially if we're not careful to maintain a healthy, daily, ongoing walk with God. Christians are, after all, we're still human beings. As such, there's a sense that we're still part of the problem that needs fixing. But if you're a Christian, at least you've got one huge advantage. You're now at least on the right side of the spiritual divide. In that through Jesus Christ, you've been saved. You've been brought into a right relationship with God. You're now part of God's family. And your eternal destiny is secure in Christ. But we've all still got a long way to go before we're even close to being what God wants us to be. So you see, Christianity then is not really about Christians. It's about Christ. He's the one who makes the difference. He's the one who came to show us the way. As the Son of God, He is the object of our faith and worship. Everything we have, everything we are, everything we do is, as Christians is because of Jesus and who He is. What He's done for us and what He continues to do for us. As far as the, fifth, the, the Christian faith is concerned, everything begins and ends with Christ. The central event in the life of Christ is the cross. The hope of our salvation rests on what he accomplished there. His death, burial, and resurrection are the central truths of the Christian faith. No cross, we've got no Christ. And without Christ, we've got no Christianity. So this morning, I want us to focus our attentions on the cross. To remind ourselves just, just how significant it is, how essential it is to our faith. I've chosen as my text just one verse. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it's verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us who are saved, it's the power of God. Where do we start with a subject matter as immense as this? It's just not possible to cover all that could be said or needs to be said in just a half hour sermon. So I want us to focus our thoughts around just three main points. What Christ suffered on the cross, how he suffered it, and why. Number one, what? What was it that Jesus suffered as he hung on the cross? And number two, how? How was his attitude, his mindset as he faced the cross and endured his suffering? And then, number three, why, why, why did he endure the suffering and the death of the cross? So firstly, what was the nature of his suffering? Well, the first thing Jesus <coughs> suffered was pain. Physical pain. Pain of the most excruciating intensity. Now, no death no matter how seemingly easily and gently it might take place, no death is without its measure of pain. At the very least, there's the pain of loss. The pain of separation from those whom you love and who are dear to you. The sad thought that you will not see them again, at least not in this life. <coughs> but beyond that, death on the cross involved not just physical pain and suffering, but beyond our ability to imagine. There was the piercing of his hands at his feet. It was not enough that Jesus hang exposed on the cross until he breathed his last, but he was nailed to the cross. Cold, hard, iron spikes hammered in his hands and feet through his muscles and his sinews, his flesh. 
And as he hung there on the cross, with the full weight of the body pulling on those nails, even the slightest movement would evince the most excruciating pain. And move he must if he wanted to breathe. Anyone hanging on the tree, they had to pull themselves up enough to allow them the lungs to draw in breath and to breathe. And how many times does the average human being breathe in an hour? Those condemned to die on a cross could sometimes hang there for hours, sometimes two or three days or more before they finally breathed the last. And we must remember that Christ's suffering that day didn't begin <coughs> when they put him on the cross. He'd already suffered that day at the hands of his captors. The soldiers had beaten him. They pulled at his beard while he was in their custody. They placed a crown of thorns on his head and drove it into his brow so that it might draw blood. And then his back had been mercilessly ripped apart after the Roman prefect had ordered he was <coughs> scourged by whip. And now his body hung on the nails that held him to the cross. So all I want to say about that today is nothing redeeming or uplifting about crucifixion. It's arguably the cruelest mode of death ever devised by mankind. Death on the cross was designed to maximize the suffering of the victim for as long as possible. What does that say about us? What kind of a human being would sit down to invent such a thing? And then not only think about it, but then actually follow through and inflict such cruelty upon another human being. The death of the cross stands, if nothing else, as an indictment against humanity. It's a testimony to the depths of cruelty and malice of which we are capable. So the cross speaks to us then of physical suffering. But that wasn't the only way Jesus suffered that day. Jesus also suffered personally in a way that no one else ever could. You see, Jesus is the perfect, sinless Son of God. Is the Holy One, pure in all His motives, perfect in all His attributes. When Jesus hung there on the cross, He didn't hang there as a criminal. He was guilty of no crime. He was guilty of no sin. Three times, uh, Pontius Pilate, the Roman prefect, in interrogating Christ, declared officially, I find in Him no fault. And yet, Jesus still hung there on the cross, his shame and humiliation for all to see. Have you ever been falsely accused? Accused of doing something that you didn't do? How did that make you feel? It probably caused you great anguish. No one likes to be thought ill of. And to know that someone else thinks less of you because of a misunderstanding or a lie it's the worst feeling. Now, Jesus was the Son of God. He knew what his purpose was in coming to earth before he was ever born in the <coughs> He said, I came not to be served, but to serve. To give my life as a ransom for many. He'd come to earth with the express purpose of giving his life in death to be the final, ultimate sacrifice for the sins of God. But he was also fully man. His divine knowledge did not for a moment diminish in any way his very human suffering. How sharp the pain it must have been for somebody with so noble a spirit as he to endure the shame of the cross. Knowing himself to be wholly innocent and yet there he hung treated as a common criminal before the eyes of all people. And as he hung there on the cross, he was forsaken even by his own. The disciples, the very men that he'd chosen to be with him, the very men into whom he had poured all of the wisdom of God, they abandoned him. They fled from the scene of his capture. And as Christ looked down from the cross, on the cold and sneering faces looking back at, back at him, he also saw a few women there, weeping for him. And 
deepest sympathy and anguish. And there was his mother, Mary. It must have felt as though her heart were being torn in two to witness her son, her firstborn, put to death on a cross. She could not possibly know the reasons why he had to die. She couldn't possibly have understood that it was as much for her sake as for anyone that he died there that day. Jesus had come to be the saviour of the world. He'd come to redeem or to restore humankind from its sinful fallen state, to bring forgiveness, to bring the way of salvation, to bring us back to God, to bring us out of the darkness of spiritual ignorance and fear and into the full light of his truth and love. And in the shedding of his blood for the sins of the world, he also made it possible for her to be saved. But she couldn't understand that there that day, standing before the cross. So we noted, here's Jesus suffering the agony of physical death, but also enduring the personal gain, the uh, pain of shame and humiliation. And then thirdly, he suffered spiritually, as no man has ever suffered. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible tells us, he who knew no sin, became sin for us. When Jesus died on the cross, He, as the Holy Son of God, took all <coughs> our sins on Himself. As the Apostle Peter tells us, He bore our sins in His own body on the tree. What must it have been like? What must it have been like for the pure, spotless Son of God to bear our sins in Himself? He who had ever only known the perfections of heaven, the splendor and glory of eternity, bore in himself all the ugliness and the filth, all the base ill will and malice of humanity. I can't get my head around what that must have meant for him. The best I can do is maybe come up with a couple weak illustrations Sometimes we speak of an individual and we say he's like a fish out of water. <clears throat> we all know what that means. Maybe it's somebody who's lived all his life in the city, let's say the city of London, right? And then they move into the countryside. Nothing's quite done as it's done in London, you know? In the city, he knew how everything worked. He was used to the conveniences of life in the city. He knew what people were interested in there, what they liked to do and what you could talk about. But then he finds himself in a small country village. Nothing quite works in the same way in the country as it does in the city. People are different. They act differently. They've got different routines. They do different things. They talk about different things. Sometimes from the people in the city, they struggle to adjust to country life because it's just something they're not familiar with, something with which they've had no prior experience. Or perhaps, we might think of a child. Maybe he's grown up with a very privileged life. Could even be one of the royal children, a prince or a princess who's grown up in the palace. They've had servants to wait on them hand and foot. How many of us have had that? They've enjoyed the best this world has had to offer. The best food, the finest clothes, the most beautiful surroundings, the best education that can be provided. Imagine what it would be like for a child like that to suddenly leave all that behind and to find themselves living on an inner city council estate. And not one of the nicer ones either. But one where the drug culture is prevalent, where rival gangs rule the streets, where crime is rife and it's dangerous to go out even in the middle of the day. What a contrast. Now imagine what it must have been like for Jesus when left behind the kingdom of glory to come to this earth and to walk amongst us. He's the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, God only wise, whom 10,000 times 10,000 angels and thousands and thousands and more sing his praises ever. He'd ever only known the splendor of light and the fellowship of eternal love, dwelling in the place where no unclean thing could ever enter. And now think of him coming to live on this earth where greed and corruption and deception and malice not only exist, but thrive and flourish. 
and then see him hang there on a cross, bearing in himself all the sin and shame of this world. We can't possibly conceive how he must have felt. What spiritual suffering he bore in his own body on the tree. And the thing is that you and I, we can't see the future. We can't see the future. We can't see what's coming. But Jesus was under no such illusion. He knew exactly what lay ahead of him. And yet he bravely and courageously faced his cup of suffering. The cross was not only an instrument of death, it was an instrument of torture and pain, a symbol of shame and humiliation. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 22 reminds us that he who is hanged is a curse of God. And when Jesus became sin for us, his Holy Father could no longer look on him, his own son. And that fellowship, what they had enjoyed from time immemorial, was broken for a moment. And Jesus cried out in his suffering, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus suffered spiritually as no man ever has. Now there's so much more that can be said, but for now, I must respectfully move on. We've seen what Christ suffered on the cross. We've seen that he suffered physical pain. He suffered personally humiliation. And shame. He suffered a spiritual agony that no one else has ever known. But how? How is it possible? Like I said, Jesus knew it was coming. After all, it was God and, and nothing was hidden from him. He prayed, remember, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. But Jesus went to the cross in spite of all. So how did he approach the suffering that he was to face? For one thing, the Bible tells us that Jesus did what he did, in part, out of obedience. Obedience to the Father's will. In a prophecy from the Psalms in the Old Testament, it was said of Christ, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book that is written of me. I delight to do your will, O Lord. Your law is within my heart. <coughs> then in the Gospels, Jesus tells his disciples, I came down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. When it's in Gethsemane, you remember, on the night that he was betrayed, he prayed, <coughs> Not my will, but yours be done. What Jesus did then, he did in obedience to his Father's will. Now we must be careful that we understand just exactly what these words mean. It does not mean that God the Father somehow took some kind of sick pleasure in seeing his Son suffer abuse and death on the cross. Not even close. No, it was the will of the Father to see the world redeemed. To grant deliverance once and for all from the judgment of death and hell. And that's why Jesus went to the cross to be a sacrifice for our sins, for you and for me. But he didn't just go obediently to do the Father's will. He went willingly. If you've got your Bibles, turn for a moment to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I'm going to read just a few verses here from this very familiar passage. John chapter 10 and verse 9. Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if anyone enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Then look down at verse 17. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my 
Father. Do you know what this tells us here? It tells us that Jesus did what he did of his own will. When we die, we've got no choice in the matter. That wasn't the case with Jesus. No one forced him to do what he did. He says, I lay down my life. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down to myself. <coughs> and just so we don't mistake his meaning, he goes on to say, I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. The word he used here for power isn't the kind of power or energy that you and I need to do a thing. It's the power of authority. Jesus is saying, when I lay down my life on the cross, no one has forced me to do it. I do it under my own authority. It's my will to do it. It's my right to do it. There's a sense in which Jesus didn't have to follow through with the cross. At one point he said, I could call down 10,000 angels. And they would have come and fought for me. If you remember, it only took one angel to destroy an entire army in the Old Testament. When Pilate, the Roman prefect, thought he could threaten Jesus, the Lord looked straight back at him and said, You could have no power over me except that we're giving you from above. Do you remember from that point on we're told Pilate did everything he could to try and set Jesus free. Christ did what had to be done because he wanted to do it. He shared the same desire, the same goal, the same purpose, the same will to see humankind redeemed as did the Father. And so Jesus stepped in to do what had to be done, knowing he was the only one who could do it. And this is why Jesus can say, therefore, for this reason, the Father loves me. Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Lord Creator, the King Eternal. And yet he bowed his head to his enemies. He allowed them to do their worst. He submitted to their cruelties with meekness and with humility. Isaiah prophesied that Christ would go as a lamb led to the slaughter. Just as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he opened on his mouth. Jesus humbly submitted to every cruelty, to every humiliation <coughs> his enemies could meet out upon him. And then he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But of all the motives that we can discern in the Lord Jesus for doing what he did, above them all, there was love. We can say he did it all for love. Jesus said, greater love is no one than this. The man laid down his life for his friends. How can we put a measure on such love? What kind of love is it that would motivate God to humble himself and become like one of us, one of his lowly creatures. And then to suffer and die for us. To redeem us, a rebellious, hard-hearted, stubborn people. Surely, love, as the Apostle Paul writes, is, one, is the greatest of all. I think Charles Wesley puts it like this in, in his hymn. Love divine, all loves itself. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure, unbounded love, thou art. So far this morning, we've looked at the nature of Christ's suffering on the cross. <clears throat> we considered his mindset as he approached the cross. He went to the cross obediently. He went willingly. He went in humility and in meekness. He went to the cross because of the greatness of his love for us. But we haven't yet addressed the reason why. Why did he do it? Why go through with the cross? Was there no other way? Why was it so necessary for him to suffer and die? We've already read, touched on a couple of reasons why. One purpose was seen that he went to the cross in fulfilling the scripture to accomplish the will of the Father. Isaiah chapter 53 tells us that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Was the chastisement of our peace was laid on him. And with his stripes we are healed. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. But he shall live to see the travail of his soul. And he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. But he shall bear their iniquities. He has poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many. And made intercession for transgressors. Jesus died on the cross to fulfill the word of God. He died on the cross to fulfill the will of God. He accomplished all that was spoken of him. There's a third purpose in his dying on the cross. And that was to satisfy the justice of God. You see in all of this. We are the guilty party. God has done nothing wrong. He's not treated us unkindly or unjustly. It's we who treat him in a way undeserving of his goodness and grace. Humankind are the ones who rebel against his creator God. Rather than to submit gratefully and joyfully to him and to all that is good and perfect, we chose instead to turn our back on him and to follow a path of our own choosing. A path which ultimately and inevitably leads to its own destruction. But rather than to destroy sinful, rebellious humankind, something which, as our Creator was entirely within His rights to do, He desired instead to see us redeemed, to be forgiven, to see us restored in fellowship to Himself. There was just one problem. <coughs> you see, the wages of sin is death. Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Sin must be paid for. We understand this concept. If someone breaks the law today, there's a consequence. There has to be a consequence. If you break the law, you've got to pay for your crimes. And God is a just and holy God. Wrongdoing must be judged. As a holy God, He cannot, He will not let wrong go unanswered. If a sin has been committed, the guilty party must face the consequences. <coughs> the guilty one must die. But Jesus came to take the judgment of our sin on himself. He came to die in our place. He hung on the cross to satisfy the demands of God's holy law. He suffered and died in payment of our debt, the debt of our sin and guilt. Jesus came to take away sin. He came to destroy the power of death once and for all. <coughs> When he suffered and died on the cross, he was taken down and buried in the tomb. The stone was rolled across the entrance. The door was sealed shut. But that was not the end. Because on the morning of the third day, Jesus rose again from the grave. He was victorious. He had overcome. He had won the victory over sin and death. And now he has the power to save completely, to save to the utmost all who come to God. By him. When you come in faith to Jesus and you commit your soul and heart to him, he promises to save you. From the moment you trust in him, you are delivered from the power of sin. You are delivered from the sentence of death. You are granted new life, spiritual life, eternal life through Jesus Christ. Many people hold a condescending view of Jesus. They see him only as a meek and mild man, the gentle shepherd, the one who is all love and forgiveness and kindness, the healer who humbly submitted to shame and humiliation at the hands of his enemies. All that's true, but there's so much more. The love of Jesus is not something weak, it's not some sentimental feeling, it's the power of God. It's a love that reaches across time and space. Jesus, the Son of God, crossed over into our world, if you will, that he might redeem us. It was not the nails that kept him hanging on the cross, but his love for you and for me. It was a love so powerful that he did not give up until he had accomplished everything he intended to do. There's only one response worthy of such love, and that's to come to Jesus. Humbly 
and gratefully. To give ourselves to him in return. To love and trust him with all our heart. As Wesley puts it in that same hymn, Thee we would be always blessing. Serve thee as thy hosts above. Pray and praise thee without ceasing. Glory in thy perfect love. A few thoughts for your consideration this morning. Christ on the cross. Trust there's something there that God can use to speak to your heart. If you sense a need within your own life and right to come, you can leave today knowing that all is well between you and you. Right, we're going to sing a hymn.